Good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to the 2019 Senator Claiborne Powell Lecture on Arts and Humanities. I love the nightlife, culture, politics, and policy after dark. My name is Stephanie Fortunato, and I'm the director of Providence's Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. Thanks. <laughs> um, once a year, ACT organizes a public dialogue to celebrate the late Rhode Island Senator Pell's legacy. By bringing the community together to explore a cultural policy issue of importance, we support the growth and resilience of our local creative ecosystem. As we begin the program, I'd like to acknowledge that we are occupying the land stewarded by the first peoples who inhabited the area, the Narragansett, or the people of the Little Point, or people of the Point and Bays, and the Wampanoag, the people of First Light, or the people of the East. I want to acknowledge our enormous cultural debt to the many other tribes that made their way to harvest and trade in the Great Salt, Ca Salt Cave, now our Down City Arts District, via the Pequot Trail, what we now call Broad Street. Even before colonization, Providence was a space of great cultural exchange. I'd like to acknowledge a few people who are present this evening as well. Uh, Bonnie Nickerson, our Director of Planning, is here. She's my boss. We are joined by Councilwoman La Fortune. <laughs> Teresa Gonia, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, we have Director Lazzarini from MCCS. And we have, actually, there's many members of our city service team. Can I have everyone give a wave here? This is actually kind of an impressive interdepartmental team moment there. Lieutenant Aspinall in the back. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, the Graduate Providence, Providence Tourism Council, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, under the leadership of Randy Rosenbaum, who's here with us tonight. <laughs> Elizabeth Francis, Director of the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, a great partner, especially in this event. And more arts and humanities leaders that I can do by name, because this is already a long program. <laughs> Uh, just a bit of housekeeping here. I want to let you guys know that bathrooms are located in the back of the room. We have exits to the left and right or where you came in this evening. Um, Rosa Di Castillo is in the back of the room. She's waving her hand. She's providing simultaneously transla simultaneous translation for those more comfortable listening in Spanish. And don't forget that we are thinking together tonight about nightlife and live music culture. So as if you were in a club, please feel free to get up and get a drink from the bar during our speaking program. The notebooks in front of you are designed and printed by DWRI Letterpress in Trinity Square, and we should have plenty, so make sure you grab one so you can take notes for our question and answer later. And welcome to the historic Bohm's Theater. This is such a beautiful space. I'm so glad that we're here this evening. <laughs> So we're located on the Broad Street Cultural Corridor. The Bohm's Theater is at the heart of one of the city's top destinations for music and dancing after dark. The stripes painted down the middle of the street serve as a year-round reminder that Broad Street is the home of many Dominican people, as well as the annual Dominican Festival and Parade. It's also home to countless other cultural groups, from West Africans to South Asians to African Americans and indigenous people. The mixture of cultures that come together on Broad Street help make it one of the most dynamic cultural districts in Providence. Unfortunately, the councilman-elect for this area was unable to join us this evening, but Councilwoman La Fortune is here. The councilwoman represents Ward 3, which includes North Main Street, another important cultural corridor that was once home to some of Providence's most storied live music venues and nightclubs. The Celebrity Club in Randall Square, for example, is believed to be the first jazz club in New England where black and white audiences and musicians shared space and sound. North Main remains a destination for live music and dancing with venues like the Parlor and Tantric, as well as the Met Cafe a little further up in Pawtucket. And I'd like to invite the councilwoman up to say a few words. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, Lizzie's here too, and everyone else from ACT, which is one of the best departments. Um, 
Bonnie Nickerson's department is wonderful too. <laughs> but it's, it's one of the best departments in our city. And I think the two departments together working collaboratively to really build an arts and culture infrastructure in our city has been quite beneficial. Um, it's also just wonderful to be in this space. I actually grew up right off of Broad Street. I used to walk up and down the street. My aunt lived on Sackett Street. This was my neighborhood growing up, and now I live right off of North Main Street, which is another arts and culture um, corridor. And arts and culture has played such a significant role in my life. Growing up on this side of town, there were certain things that you didn't have access to. I never had a chance to um, take ballet lessons or um, go to the theater. Or my, one, my parents couldn't afford to do that. However, it was through educational opportunities or going to Nathaniel Green Middle School where we had an arts and theater program which exposed me to the importance of arts and theater and has contributed to my educational trajectory. So it is really important for us to invest in arts, but also looking at this space is a testament of how this investment can transform infrastructure. And I should go back to you know, the little remarks I prepared. But I thank everyone for being here tonight. All the speakers, ACT, for ensuring that we, we, we hold this um, lecture series and ensuring that we have spaces to engage in these types of dialogue. Arts, humanities, culture, areas that are interconnected with design, education, society, politics, and policy create the pillars of democracy and civil society. Matters that impact every community and can serve as a network to economic development, municipal or community infrastructure, but also um, illuminate public issues and bring about dialogue like this lecture series and support community engagement efforts and consensus building. More cities and states are finding that arts, humanities, and culture are vital components of a comprehensive strategy for growth when coupled with other strategies. We see it right here in Providence, how these components have revitalized neighborhoods and have created a place for innovation and design. Think about downtown 25 years ago. It wasn't a place that you could walk through, but now you can you know, catch a show, get a good meal. It's wonderful. People walk through the streets of downtown and enjoy the festivities of PVD Fest or Pride. And a good friend of mine in Philadelphia actually said that Pride in Providence is one of the top Pride um, festivals in the nation. So thank you. Water fire or catch a show at Trinity, PPAC, or sit by the, wood, um, the water and watch a performance, walk over our new spectacular bridge, and jam on a Friday night to Mike Rollins and friends at the district, or catch a performance at the Wilbert, the um, Wilbert Theater, written, produced, and performed by, by students of the Manton Project. And after, have a little street noodles at Troop, or be here at the Boom Theater, a building that stood vacant for years and has now been transformed into a space for arts, design, and performances. Or go down the street to City Arts and see the artistic talent of our young people. Providence is truly, it, um, is truly uh, the evidence of the impact of arts and humanities and culture and the importance and serves as the importance of investing in arts, humanities, and education. However, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many of our state legislators are not prioritizing arts, are not priori prioritizing culture, are not prioritizing humanities, and are not seeing the intersections of these areas. They don't see that it's connected to policy and politics and economic growth. So it's important for all of us to lobby our legislators, to engage with our communities, to have dialogue within our neighborhoods so that we can create spaces and we can retain our artists. We have a design school. We have programs that are teaching our students about art. So we also need to invest in retaining them. We have an opportunity to create a nightlife here. We have the space, we have the culture, we have the talent, but we need people to support these initiatives. And if we're not talking about it, no one will hear. So when we leave here tonight and after we, we engage in this discussion, I hope you take the information that you gain from tonight's event into your communities, into your workspaces, and continue to advocate for arts, humanities and culture 
It is vital. It is the bedrock of our societies. And if we're not investing in it and if we're not prioritizing it, no one will. So thank you so much to the ACT department and everyone who is here and who, who sees art, culture, um, humanities as relevant. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. I hope everyone takes that to heart, actually. Um, if you want to see how the Mount Hope neighborhood has commemorated their lively cultural history, check out the Music Mural, which is near Billy Taylor Park on Camp Street. It was a creative placemaking effort led by Dr. Danny Ritchie with support from ACT. Pretty cool mural there. So Providence really does feel the impact from Senator Pell's foundational support for the NEA, the NEH, and Pell Grants for Higher Education. In 2018 and 2019, ACT co-led the NEA-funded Wenaspawtucket River Greenway Arts Initiative in collaboration with cultural and civic partners, many were here tonight, thank you for being here, um, and, and we activated a network of key sites along the planned bike and ped greenway extensions in Olneyville Valley area. This is another one of our important nightlife and live music corridors. NEA funding helped partners leverage support from the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, which regrants funds from the NEA, and from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, which receives funding from the NEH. These federal dollars allowed our collaborative to showcase a section of the city's growing urban trail network with performance and temporary public art, and helped us lay the groundwork for future activations and infrastructure to be implemented as part of the city's Wenaspawtucket Vision Plan, which is under the very able direction of Bonnie Nickerson and the Planning Department. So we have the Pell Lecture because, because Senator Pell is important to Rhode Island and important to Providence. And 10 years ago, when he passed, ACT decided to model the first Pell Lecture on the Americans for the Arts annual Nancy Hanks Lecture at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. Previous Pell speakers have highlighted the arts, humanities, and design as catalysts for physical and social change in our city. Tonight, we will explore Providence's cultural developments by addressing its live music ecosystem. We've invited a guest lecturer to help put this work in perspective on the world stage, as well as a panel of local experts to help us ground it here in our neighborhoods. As many of you know, Mayor Lorza has made the arts and humanities central to his strategy for cultivating an inclusive and thriving Providence. Unfortunately, the mayor is unable to be here tonight, but I want to note that this administration has made investments which allow us to create new opportunities for our artist community, from PVD Fest to public art and arts education. Of course, these investments create layers on decades and decades of established cultural infrastructure. In 1900, Providence had five professional theaters, Infantry Hall, Music Hall, and the amateur Talma Theater. By 1915, there were 13 theaters in downtown Providence alone, plus three or four new neighborhood movie houses in Olneyville Square and Federal Hill. No less than 19 theaters existed downtown during the 17 years from 1902 to 1919, and 14 opened in that period. Dozens of cocktail bars, coffee shops, restaurants, and dance clubs catering to gay and lesbian clientele operated in and around Down City beginning in the 1920s and 30s. Venues like the Dreyfus Hotel Cocktail Bar, P.J. Fitzgerald's, The Fan Club, Kubla Khan, and the Gold Coin Cocktail Lounge catered to queer clientele long before the early 2000s when it became more socially acceptable to be out of the closet. Going back to the 1970s and 1980s, musicians used formerly industrial spaces around Providence to host unlicensed and all-ages events. This world became heavily associated with the burgeoning noise music scene in the 1990s with media attention that consolidated around Fort Thunder. But it has a longer history and continues to this day. In 1996, the city created the Down City Arts and Entertainment Task Force, which led to the state's first arts district in 1997. Bounded by downtown's cultural anchors, PPAC, AS220, and Trinity Rep, the Arts District was defined by tax incentives for the artists who lived and worked there. While it didn't signal a radical shift in the residential composition of the city center, this policy change certainly signaled that the city was artist friendly. 
Our flagship arts district has not only been home to theaters and live entertainment venues. Many creative businesses have flourished there over the years, including restaurants, bars, and retail establishments. 37 years ago, Mike Chanley and a friend opened a 500 square foot used bookstore in a mini mall located in the basement of Rainbow Records at 184 Matthewson Street. They named it Seller Stories for the obvious reason. They were both working other jobs to survive. Mike at his family's restaurant in the morning, his partner at various jobs in the afternoon. Almost every evening, they would go out to tape and staple printed leaflets all over the city advertising that they were looking for books to buy. After a couple of years, they were still working multiple jobs and all the money was going to rent, beer, food, and books, the staples. But it was becoming more and more apparent each day that this was not going to be making a living for a long time, if ever. The friend decided it wasn't in his heart the way it was in Mike's, so he left to pursue another path. Mike continued to build both his inventory and customer base. This was way before the internet. Ads in the New Paper and the Eagle, along with an occasional mention on WBRU, were the way a small business spread the word. Mike would also go out and meet other book lovers at the Met Cafe, Leo's and Lupo's. Eventually, the basement store found the way to its current location at 111 Matthewson Street above Blake's Tavern. You will hear people ask, why is the name of the store Seller Stories when it's on the second floor? But you'd have to know about the shop under Rainbow Records down the street to be understood. Sadly, Mike left us unexpectedly last year, leaving a large hole in the downtown arts and literary community. But the store lives on. Mike is still there in spirit and under the counter with store manager Victoria and loyal staff Justine and Joe. They carry the torch for Mike and are supported by Mike's loving family. There aren't many small businesses that are still around after 37 years that employ three full-time people. People from all over the country in the bookstore business speak fondly of Mike and seller stories. This was especially poignant during the recent Necromicon where people converge on the city and at the store. There were a few tears shed that weekend as it was also the first anniversary of his passing. In appreciation for Mike's contributions to the arts and humanities, I'd like to invite his daughter, Tracy Chanley, and Seller Stories store manager, Victoria Forsberg-Larry, up to receive citations from the city. <laughs> Councilwoman, can you help me? Stories and Mike Chanley show us how critically important particular spaces are to our cultural economy. The ripple effects one determined entrepreneur with a vision for a creative business can create are immeasurable. At ACT, we think a lot about what the city can do to support our creative sector. Our experience co-producing PVD Fest has also prompted us to think not only about the downtown, but how live music and entertainment economies function throughout. We could keep going telling the stories from all of Providence's neighborhoods, but I want to save some of the unpacking for after we've had a chance to hear from our 2019 lecturer and our panel of local experts on the topic. And of course, from you. Right now, I'd like to welcome Deputy Director Lizia Rougeau to the stage to introduce our featured speaker. I want to Lizzie has spent her career sporting and strengthening live music and social dance culture in Providence. She has slung drinks at Leo's in the Decatur, produced the R-rated Pork Chop Lounge variety show, and managed operations for AS220. She also helped produce Providence Sound Session and managed Firehouse 13 and FETS. 
today, Lizzie works at this, for the city, coordinating many things, including the Eli Neighborhood Performing Arts Series and performances, and producing our office's July 4th celebration in India Point Park, as well as the Winter Lights Market in Kennedy Plaza, December 6th and 7th. Mark your calendars, please. For four years, she facilitated our city service team that helps citizens produce events in our streets and parks, and of course, she is the heart and brains behind PBD Fest. <laughs> Last year alone, Lizzie booked 260 artists at the festival. So this is why, without further ado, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. That was some introduction, I had no idea. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm so happy that I see all these familiar faces in the room, people who've been working for years and years, sometimes without a lot of help or support to create a beautiful and thriving economy in Providence, a nighttime economy where people go and people can feel safe. I myself am a product of that nighttime economy and local music and local bands helped shape who I am and what I care about today. So this conversation is really, really important to me. I'm really happy that everybody is here. And I'd like to introduce, I'm really excited to introduce this person um, because I, I, I never thought that what we did was important, right? I never thought that music and art and culture was real. I thought that was just where I went to work every day. And this gentleman helped to bring this to the world and elevate the idea of community coming together. He thinks I'm going too far, I think. I'm looking at his face. Um, so I'm going to uh, just stop there and let him take over. Go with the mic. <laughs> wow, so it's a Thursday night, and you're here to listen to me. Um, I remember when one of my advisors always said kind of talking about music is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> and, um, but, so, so I'm gonna start just by quickly introducing myself. What an incredible honor. I found out again David Byrne did this, and he's, um, he's my hero. So um, I feel incredibly honored to be here, incredibly honored to be in Providence. Um, Providence is relatively new to me. So my name is Shane. I'm from London, despite the accent. But uh, I grew up in Canada, but I've been living in the UK for a long time, and I set up a company called Sound Diplomacy. I'm not really going to talk about us very much. I'm going to talk about why we do what we do rather than what we do. And for me, I spent 15 years in the music industry. I did a lot of different things. I played in a band, I worked in a venue, I ran festivals. I wrote, uh, I was a music journalist. I worked at a record label. You can see I wasn't very good at anything, so I tried everything. And, but one thing that I've always, um, one thing that's always fascinated me is places that we live, is cities. And I love walking around cities and trying to understand why is that building built that way? Why does that road go through this way? Every single thing that's been created in a city has been an intentional decision for the most part, right? More or less an intentional decision or an intentional decision based on something great or negative that wasn't intentional. And yet everything that I did in the music industry was being governed in cities, being impacted in cities by intentional decisions that I had nothing, I had no part in making. So I worked in a music venue and that music venue, this was in my hometown, and that music venue faced all sorts of issues with its neighbors. Some of, some of it we deserved, to be honest with you, in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, but not all of it. And I'm like, well, why is the venue there? You know, why couldn't have been down the road where it would have been a little bit quieter and would have been more beneficial for the venue and for the people that were living around us? 
And I realized that musicians and the music industry and the overarching evening and nighttime economy on the cultural side, we are being governed by decisions that we have no part in, right? There's no such thing as a music policy in a city. No, there's a noise policy. There's a planning policy that governs where things are. There's building code regulations that may or may not govern how things are built, depending on where you live. There's public safety and public health. There's policing and so on and so forth. And whether you go to it, when you go to a gig, whether that gig is indoor or outdoor, we are all being influenced and governed, I don't mean that in a negative way, by all of these policies. Yet, it is not responding to that direct and intentional relationship with music. And that just got me thinking. I'm like, well, can't we be better musical urban planners? If we had a part to say, if we, as, as in I'm a terrible musician, but this is just me thinking I was a great one, even though I wasn't. Um, this is why I'm talking to you now and not playing drums. Um, but my thinking was, if I had a seat at that table, what would I say, right? If I was able to offer some advice when something was being built, how could I influence that something so that music was built in rather than bolted on? And that is what made me think about, well, okay, well, we don't have a voice. The role of the music industry, the role of music and the role of culture in how we govern cities is not well understood, right? Through this lack of policy, this lack of understanding, I was saying that our, using our, our local councillor saying you didn't, didn't have uh, access to certain things, to, to cultural experiences when you were growing up and you had it at school. Those were deliberate and intentional decisions that led to to that access being denied. And I know there are a lot of negative reasons for that. And I think we can build better cities. I think we can make places better. And I think we can make places better through music and culture. And that is what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today. So, yeah. so I start with two people drinking bottled water. I Googled people drinking bottled water. <laughs> and so why, why, why do I have this slide? So how, how many of you guys have had a sip of water on the table today? Right, quite a few. And how many people took a drink of water today? If you didn't put your hand up, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be drinking eight glasses a day. <laughs> so when... This is the result of a very, very extensive system of things working to get this to our mouth. Right? This water had to be sourced, it had to be purified, potentially desalinated, these bottles had to be made, wells have to be dug, in, d dug, dig in, dug, pipes need to be laid, and so on and so forth to get this water to this bottle or to our tap so that we can drink clean water and feel safe that we're drinking clean water. And we, in this room, are very lucky that we can drink clean water, right? And so are those people. Right? They're just drinking their bottles of water for some reason, not looking at each other while they're doing it. And how many of you listened to a song today? So did you think about everything that went into making that song when you were listening to that song? Did you think about the recording studio, the engineer, the building of the mixing desk? Someone had to make those instruments. It had to be recorded. That music had to be distributed somehow. Someone's paying for that music to get to your ears. There's all these systems in place that made that exact moment happen, right? And without those systems, there is no song. There is no music. Yet, we disassociate the infrastructure that allows things to happen while we're enjoying something happening. We're walking across a bridge, we're probably not thinking about that it's been built, maintained, is not going to fall down, right? I see music the same way, and I see nightlife the same way. Music and nightlife is part of the infrastructure of a city. It's part of what makes a place a place. And most importantly, it's, I see it as a natural resource, like water, right? To me, great music just appears and I know that's not true. It's created over a long period of time. But when I hear a great song or I'm at a gig and I'm in that moment, I'm not thinking about the infrastructure, but I'm trusting that it exists. And in order, 
we have to we have to think about how we can reverse engineer that process to ensure that we are never ever going to be in a world where there's no music or there's no clean water. So I also ask you this question, right? In 20 years, I'm not gonna read off a screen. Everyone can read, right? Okay, my jokes aren't really working today, I feel, <laughs> thus far. I've got a couple more, but. Um, I truly, so I, I'm from the UK. I live in the UK, I do a lot of work in London. Um, I have a lot of examples from the UK, it's just because where I live. And I, I found out last week that over two million call center jobs have been lost in the last 10 years in the UK, and a further three to four million jobs are going to be lost because of automation of call centers in varying degrees, right? Because how many times do you call and then you have to get through a whole like hedge maze of crazy before you finally get to a person when you call Verizon or Sprint, right? Or someone else. This is automation. And what I've realized is that the only jobs that we're going to have in 20 years are jobs that require us to think creatively jobs that require us to understand technology and to be innovative. Those jobs are jobs that are tied to culture. Those jobs are jobs that are tied to arts and to music. And we need to really understand how we can prioritize the jobs that we need in the future and the role that arts and culture and music has in it because what makes a great place, right? I'm not going to answer that right now, but everyone here, you're here because you love Providence. And, you know, the 16 hours I've been here, I'm kind of loving it too. It's great. <laughs> um, and I, I had a little bit of a walk around today, and, you know, I, I, I feel I'm barely scratching the surface of what, of this, to me, uh, this great place. But I also recognize that a great place means different things to different people. A great place is about community and comfort. It's the fact that you can congregate in a place and feel safe doing so. And there are many, many different ways that people congregate, and there's many, many different ways that people feel safe. Yet we do not have a planning, a licensing, and a regulatory system that enables for that to happen for everybody. And this is what happens with nightlife and the nighttime economy, and music. When I say the word nightclub, some image is going to appear in all of your brains, right? When I say the word music venue, it means something, right? The word music venue to me means the music venues that I went to when I was playing. Mainly, like, there's a puddle on the stage, I barely got electrocuted, never wanted to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, but it's true, like, I grew up playing and going to dive bars. That was just my life, and that's what I tried to understand a music venue. But a music venue to other people are completely different things. A music venue is an opera house. A music venue could be the back room of a Caribbean restaurant. A music venue could be just a public square, right? And we, and nightclubs are the same. Nightclubs can be, and to me are, community centers. They're places that the community congregates to feel safe and to feel like they're part of something. Yet, we do not have a process and a policy, and I'm not talking about Providence, I'm talking about around the world, that recognizes the community benefit, the cultural benefit, and the overarching benefit of what makes a great place. And a great place is not just a city, a great place is every element of a city. So, I'm gonna ask, answer some basic questions. First off, is what is the nighttime economy? And um, there's a few things. The nighttime economy, first off, is an economy. <laughs> it is a place where people work. And in New York, there aren't that many cities that have done economic impact assessments of the nighttime economy. New York has done it, and it's worth $35 billion there, which is a lot of money. But if you think about a typical music venue or nightclub, right? How many people went to a gig in the last month or went to a club? A few? All right, not enough of you. And, um, and it's okay. There's gigs tonight, <laughs> I hear. And a music venue, to me, is so much more than just the artist playing on stage or the person DJing or rapping or rhyming, right? 
Think about all the jobs and skills that are required in that space for that gig to happen. First off, someone had to build the stage. Someone had to rig the lights. There needs to be a sound person. There's security. The posters had to be designed. Someone's got to work behind the bar. There's legal. There's accounting. I could go on and on and on. We actually counted it in the UK. There's between 25 and 30 different jobs and skills that are incubated any time an artist takes the stage in a venue. Think about it. That is where I got my start. I learned how to do loads of different things poorly <laughs> because I wasn't very good. But I learned how to be a crap accountant, a terrible lawyer, a horrible marketer, and a really bad drummer. But I also learned that this was the place that I understood how business works. I understood how to treat customers fairly. I understood what customer service was. And none of this would happen if there wasn't that artist on stage. The artist on stage is the nucleus of that situation. And a music venue in a nightclub is an innovation hub. It's an incubator. And in London, we've had a lot of venues close in the last 10 years. We're turning the corner now, but we, had, we were in crisis where we lost 35% of our music venues in 10 years, about 90, 85 to 90 venues. Every time an artist plays on stage, what they're doing is they're incubating their intellectual property, right? Every time they play a song, that's beta testing your intellectual property. So let's say you have five artists a week. Each of those artists then, that means you have 20, as I would say, artists or small businesses every month incubating their intellectual property in this innovation hub or incubator. So there was this artist in London that I saw um, play at one of these small venues and got to know a little bit. That small venue closed down, and that artist is Adele. How incredibly valuable is that piece of intellectual property now? And if we break down the economy of the nighttime economy, overarching, and I'm not just, I'm just using a music venue as an example, but that's everything from libraries, nightclubs, restaurants, bars, but also um, the service economy that makes a city tick, and that includes, obviously, transport, healthcare, logistics, hospitality, and so on, there, there is a huge economic impact to recognize and understand the value of the nighttime economy, and yet we have no policy around it. The policy is let's stop it from happening because people want to sleep. <laughs> and I believe that that is, n that is not the right way that we should be thinking about it. And but I am an advocate of sleep. I slept last night. I hope to sleep tonight. And I want people to be living in a vibrant downtown, town center. I, want, I know that a lot of people are moving down in downtown here, right? And, the, and it's becoming more vibrant. I want people to sleep. But I don't want it to come at the expense of the loss of these incubators and innovation hubs. There's a better way to do that because this is how we govern cities, right? We are proactive during the day and reactive at night. Licensing is reactive. Something bad happens, you react to it, and you set up a policy to try to stop things from happening just in case one of them ends up being bad, right? And I'm not saying that there aren't problems there, I know. We have problems in London. I have problems in lots of other cities that we work. I know there's issues here with inequity and with crime and with alcoholism and all sorts, like there are everywhere. But what we do is we don't look at the nighttime economy from a proactive structure. We, don't, we, we plan for the day and we react and license at night. And we don't have policy positions that are dedicated to understanding the impact positive and negative, of the nighttime economy on our cities. We don't even know what it is. We haven't defined the nighttime economy in Providence. What is it that we're talking about? It could be everything I just said, or it could be focused on nightlife specifically. It could be what we call life at night, which includes every job related to the nighttime economy. Because another issue, there's no workers' rights at night. Right? Safety of women is an issue. Serious issues with physical access to venues. People can't get into places. It's ridiculous. I wouldn't want to turn down a customer. <laughs> right? So this is because we've developed a policy and a system that 
is constantly reacting to issues. It's not proactively understanding issues. And this is what happens. We get news headlines like this. I've just picked a couple in the UK, where I don't believe it's true that nightclubs all over Europe are closing, but that article does believe it. But there have been a lot of closures. In, in the UK, there's been 50% of nightclubs. Half of our nightclubs have closed down, traditional nightclubs. And we also get headlines like this. And these just make me really, really sad. So I'll leave it up for a second so you can just see some of these headlines. Closure of music venues, gentrification in town centers, artists who are the reasons why places are cool, then they can't live there anymore. That really drives me mad. And I've been victim to that as well. And so on and so forth. And then I started to do a little bit of research about Rhode Island. I don't know very much about Rhode Island, um, to be honest. I, you know, as I said, the first time that I was here, I drove through, I looked at some big houses and ate some clams and took some pictures and enjoyed myself. And, and then I went to Federal Hill and had a massive dinner, which was delicious, of American Italian food. And, um, but I don't really know. So I started to say, okay, well, well, is Rhode Island, how is Rhode Island doing in terms of job creation? How is Rhode Island doing in terms of its education provision? And is Rhode Island losing talent? Is there a potential brain drain here? Or is it incubating talent, keeping talent here? Right? And I saw a couple pretty negative headlines. <laughs> and what I recognized was, OK, well, if that's not a very good headline, because I don't think Rhode Island is the worst state to do business in. You guys are all really lovely people. You seem like you want to do business. <laughs> um, but what we recognize is, okay, well, we haven't really understood then, well, why people live in a place. As I said, what makes a place great? And what makes a place great means understanding that music and the nighttime economy policy is part and parcel of how a city, how a region, how a state governs itself. And one of the things that you can do is you can make a lot of friends through your culture. We all do it through food. And cities that take music seriously and I'll explain what that means in a second. Cities that understand the economic, social, and cultural value of nightlife also recognize the challenges of it, but do it proactively, engaging people better, having, having fact-based discussions rather than emotion-based discussions, create better places to live. So this is one of the issues, right? In the UK, the average age of a local councillor is 58. So yeah, 58 years old, right? I, they wanted me to run for local council, but then I wouldn't be here and I'd be, I would hate, I, it's not for me. I've, I, I find your job incredible, how you do it. Running local councils is an incredible, incredible job and everyone should be, um, you know, everyone should be very proud of all their local councillors. And in the UK, it's 58 years old. So we started to survey a few of them. And of the 100 local councillors that I surveyed, two had been to nightclubs in the last five years. Two. Both of them awesome, by the way. So here we are where a lot of the people that are making the decisions are people that are not experiencing the culture. This is not a value judgment on anybody. This is just the way it is. So we have to understand that our, our, what we love in terms of music and culture, in terms of nightlife, may be different from other people. And by creating an agnostic, fact-based policy around it that creates rules and regulations and structures, we can better engage with local communities. And local councillors can be more engaged in making decisions around this where their entire constituents are involved in the discussion. Because in where I'm from, the people who are making decisions just simply do not understand some of the challenges. And that's not because they're not wonderful people and they're not good at their job. It's just because they don't go to these venues. They go to other venues. And the same, the same goes with development, right? The same goes often real estate developers are not the ones that are going to music venues, do not understand the role. And so we have to really understand that who makes decisions is incredibly important and that everyone in this room, we need to develop forums through policy where we have a better decision-making process around music and nighttime economy. Because what happens is it increases economics, it increases tourism, and it makes places more 
equitable, right? That's the one thing. Music is the only cross-generational art form. I listen to the same music as my grandparents. I'm sure some of you guys do as well, right? Well, I, I, I do. And also, again, music is our universal language. We all speak it. So developing a policy around it is part of what makes a place great. Because we're competing for all of you guys. And every, every person that leaves Rhode Island is someone that just wasn't given the best reason to stay. And I believe that music and the nighttime economy and understanding this policy is the way to do it. So I'm going to give three examples, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what a music and nighttime economy, economy policy can be. Are you guys still with me? OK, good. I have a really good, so there's, my quick aside is I have this presentation to property developers in the UK. So there was a study, I'm not joking, there was a study done in June in the UK by the British Property Federation, the National Trade Association for Property, that said that only 2%, 2% of the UK population trusted property developers. And I bet you that 2% were property developers. <laughs> And it's the same thing. And we, we start to realize by, cr by really understanding how we can bring music and nightlife more into how we govern, how we understand, how we think about cities. What we're actually doing is we're developing trust. We're developing trust be be between those who govern, those who own, those who use, and those who experience. And that is what creates cultural bonds that get us through challenging situations like potential antisocial situations or situations of crime or things like that where we recognize that specific incidents have, have their own unique stories. There's reasons why things happen. And just because there's a stabbing doesn't mean all nightclubs should be closed down, right? If there, it's the same thing is just because there's one car accident, should we just close the highway? Yeah. And, and in, in the UK, 80% of noise complaints are residential. So we thought we would just ban houses. And then we get around 80% of the noise complaints. It's, this is the way that we think when it comes to music and the nighttime economy. It's emotional. It's not fact-based. It doesn't say that everyone is a good actor. That is not true. It's not that we should have a nightclub on every corner or a music venue on every corner. We shouldn't. We need to understand what we need as a community. We need to asset, we need to understand and asset map our local communities. Recognize where places are and protect them. So here's a couple examples. This is Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam is one of the global leaders in nighttime economy. They've done a ton of work and they've reduced antisocial behavior. Uh, and crime through deliberate and intentional nighttime economy policies. I'll share this presentation after as well with everyone. This is a job that, uh, this is something I did in London, which I'm quite proud of. The word surgeries means something different in England for some reason. A surgery is when you come and talk to people. I, I don't know why. <laughs> Sorry. So a night surgery is like, a, like an office hours, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, and, so we're working with our night czar, uh, which is a position that I developed for the mayor of London, our nighttime economy night mayor manager. She goes to different parts of London every month and just talks to people. Goes to, goes to the firehouse, goes to the nightclub, goes on public transit and just talks to people. And we record everything and we look at what, you know, what people are unhappy with and we catalog everything to really understand what the local issues are related to the nighttime economy. And then this is something that I've worked very, very hard on in the UK um, that, that I've heard is quite relevant to Providence. Who has heard of the agent of change principle? Four people. And who hasn't heard of it? Everybody else, right? OK. So this is something that I worked on in the UK. It is a pro it's a planning law or guideline or guidance or ordinance, whatever you would call it, that originated both in San Francisco and Melbourne. And it essentially says that the person who is initiating the change, i.e. the new development that goes in, is responsible for mitigating the risks of everyone around them. So if there's a new development that goes up next to a music venue, it's the development's legal responsibility to soundproof either the music venue 
Same if a music venue is built in a residential neighborhood, it's the music venue's responsibility. And the idea is, is that if we build places that are, that are fit for purpose, if we double glaze, if we understand that design impacts human experience, that we can build entertainment hotspots, things that make noise, and so on, and residential together. And there's many, many examples of this. So because all the venues, a number of venues were closing, a lot of venues were closing in London due to this issue. So we worked really hard and we passed the, a, na a national law. So now this is a law in the UK that every music venue, nightclub, recording studio, rehearsal space, Did I turn it off? Oh, take two. Oh, this one's louder. Um, if you're there first and you are abiding by your license and you're abiding by the law and you're a good neighbor, then you are protected. That's the agent of change principle. So every, and this, a city council can enact an ordinance. I know it's far more complicated than this, <laughs> but it, there, there are ways to do this now where we can protect cultural infrastructure and support new development. It doesn't need to be either or. And I'm saying one of, the, one of our allies in this in Australia was the Pig Farming Association, because a lot of people were moving next to farms and complaining about the smell. So, yeah. Why would you move next to a pig farm? And I'm jo and I swear that someone was probably making that complaint while having a bacon sandwich. <laughs> so, the agent of change principle um, is a guidance that I can provide to everybody. Uh, it's in national UK law. It, um, San Francisco does it. Uh, a number of U.S. cities are now looking at it as well, including New York, Pittsburgh, Fort Lauderdale, a few others. Um, and there are some cities in Europe that have abided by it too, but we're the only country, the U.K. is the only country that's done it. So what is a music policy? And I'll wrap up quickly. So a music policy understands the holistic value of music across what makes a city a great place, right? It's the role of music in education, in economic development, in tourism, in equity and social inclusion, that one's really important. Um, and in understanding how music can tell a story to bring people together. That means understanding your assets, mapping them, really recognizing what is in a place because there's more here than you think. Knowing where the studios are, rehearsal spaces, music choirs, music teachers, music venues, festivals, and so on. Understanding the economic value of it. Right? Knowing how much it's worth, because there are some people that you sometimes need to convince and that's all they care about. So having numbers helps. And really recognizing the economic value of culture is hugely important. But also how it all fits together and how all those policies I mentioned at the beginning impact music. A music policy is a voice for music within all other city policies. Over a hundred cities around the world are doing this. This is relatively new. I'm one of the reasons why, for better and worse, that this is happening. We've worked in over 50 cities around the world doing this and really recognizing this deliberate and intentional structure around music. And I'm not talking about specifically growing the music industry or, um, or noise laws, but music holistically across a community. So that's a little infographic that we designed that outlines what a music ecosystem is and how it impacts a town and a city and really understanding when I told you about that song, the value chain that music has, right? Again, you're not gonna buy that extra beer if the band stops playing. And that extra beer is economic value to that venue and so on and so forth. And I know, and if we understand that value, then we can protect it and we can promote it and we can preserve it and we can grow it. And when we look at the nighttime economy, there's key things that we can do to recognize its value. The first thing is to understand, A, that it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's half the day. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and that no matter what, we are going to be living in increasingly denser cities. So we either grow out or we grow up. And whether we grow out or we grow up, we are all going to have to learn to live in closer proximity often with less resources, and that we need to recognize that how we build, how we design, and how we govern 
impact the impact the success of the nighttime economy in a particular city. We have to recognize that everyone, everyone is equal, regardless of what you look like, how you access venues, if you're a man or a woman, everyone deserves to be, to have a safe and fair and equitable access to the nighttime economy. And that requires policy. That requires understanding how everyone accesses the nighttime economy, physically and mentally. Recognizes that different people's offers are equally important. Not everyone drinks alcohol anymore. Quite a few people aren't drinking alcohol. There's, there's, relig there's religions that don't drink alcohol. But they still experience the nighttime economy. And also understanding that stopping things from happening, trying to stop things from happening doesn't mean they're not happening, right? So regulating in a way that allows people to, it's often feeling, regulating in a way that, pe that allows people to express themselves, but not telling them what to do, just providing the overarching support that the nighttime economy, it's not good or bad, it's here. The nighttime economy is something, it's like picking up the garbage every week. It's like paving the roads. It's like, it's all of that. It's just another thing that a city has to take responsible for in order to make a place great. So there's loads and loads of cities that do this. I know most of them. They're all on the internet. <laughs> And most of their policies are on the internet. So a little, bit of, a little bit of research helps, a little bit of understanding how other cities have struggled, because lots of cities have struggled. There's different ways to do it. Some cities appoint nightmares, which I know there are some interest in Providence to look at a, a nightmare or a nighttime economy manager or a night czar or whatever. Some cities do it through committee. Some cities do it through an elected um, local councillor. Paris's nightmare is a local councillor. Potentially, we have a local councillor here tonight who wishes to nominate herself. <laughs> As, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> joking. Um, and um, no, but that's one example. Um, sometimes it's done through a committee of, of, of business owners. Sometimes it's done through community associations. We think that the best way is a mixture of all of it. But understanding how it's done and understanding who does it is the first first thing that you need to do. And the best way is I've done some of that work for you. So I've written, oh, hold on. There's three more slides. Oh, that was the last one. So this, so we've written two guides. Um, they're available for free on our website on sounddiplomacy.com. The one on the left is 11 case studies from all over the world about how cities have managed their nighttime economy. I wrote it two years ago, so we need to write another one, but I'm a bit busy, but I will at some point. And we wrote it with this amazing woman named Andrina Saihas, you should all Google, who's the first ever can, uh, PhD candidate in nighttime economy studies at Harvard. She's very smart, <laughs> very smart, and we love her. And then the one on, the, on my left, your right, um, is a 13-point plan to understand the role of music policy in cities and how to build better music cities. So these are available for free. Please read them. If you have any questions, you can contact me, of course. And I guess last thing is we don't just want to, you know, as we say, we don't want to create places to live. We want to create places to live for. And what do we all live for? We all live for community. We all live for the people that we love. We live for great food. We live for great art and great culture and great music. And we need to ensure that we have the spaces and places in our cities that allow people to continue to create great art, great music, great culture, and also great food. Because if we don't, these people are going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. And we're going to end up with more of those headlines that I don't think you deserve. And I want to see a headline saying, Rhode Island and Providence is the first city, and I would say state, with other cities as well, that is 
taking music and nighttime economy policy so seriously that it's becoming part and parcel of how you govern, how you think about who you are, and how you make your place great. Because I know this place is great, but I know it can be greater. And I really, really hope that you see the value of music and nighttime economy the way I do. And I just want to thank the city and ACT and all of you for taking the time to, to listen to me today. So thank you so, so much. And city. We're going to remove the um, projector. You can mention the public. OK. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gina Rodriguez, Michael Salvin, Michael Christopher, Lael Badass ACT production team tonight, thank you. So f for me, uh, the, the thing about uh, Shane's talk was intentionality. And we've invited some folks up here tonight who work with great intentionality and a deliberate, deliberative curata curator's mind in creating wonderful places for people to, to come together. Uh, we have, at the end of the table, I'm going to do this. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. At the end of the table here, we have Mr. Tom Wayman. He is the director of programming for the Columbus Theater. Next to him is, yeah, yeah. Next to him is Mr. Travis Escobar. He is the board chair and founder of Millennial Rhode Island, also the project manager and public policy guru at the United Way. We have Anthony Centuri, and many of you probably know him. He is the owner, co-owner of a club called the Coliseum and the Free Play Arcade. And he's an important member of the Nighttime Economy Conversation and has been for many years. He also founded and continued an organization called the Providence Responsible Nightclub Owners Association. No, just owners organization. Uh, next up, we have the amazing uh, warrior, Roz Raskin, who has been a musician in the local scene for uh, quite a while. Her face belies her experience. Um, she is on the board of Girls Rock Rhode Island and works tirelessly for uh, equity for women in safe spaces and clubs in Rhode Island. Uh, next up is Spaka Summer, a wonderful friend to our department, a longtime curator and producer at PVD Fest, and has just opened up a gallery space in Onlyville called Public, and is a promoter and producer and finder of great young talent and a really important voice in the nighttime scene in Providence. <laughs> and then, of course, you remember Shane. Yeah, of course, of course. So is there another mic? Yeah, great. And Michael Cristofaro with the mic, thank you. So we're going to treat this like a talking stick, because um, there's only two mics here this evening. Um, so I, I would like to start with Roz, actually, tonight. Um, because when we, we spoke a little bit, I spoke with everybody a very little bit about this conversation before we were here tonight. And Roz spoke a lot about intentionality and being deliberative about creating spaces and thinking about making safe spaces for people to be. And so I'd love you to give, it, to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much. Um, wow, to be on this stage in a very different way right now. Um, I would say when I think about talking about safe spaces, which I know is sort of like a buzz term in a lot of um, 
communities in general, we need to redefine what we think of as safety. So for example, uh, I feel like there's a lot of struggle with people saying a space is specifically safe, when in reality, a space is maybe safer because there are discussions happening within that space about how to make it safer, but nobody can say that an individual space is safe, in my opinion. So I might feel safe here, but somebody else might say they don't feel safe here. So I think that we need to be thinking about the ways in which we're discussing those things in order to bring in uh, more inclusive communities of people to feel like their voices are actually being heard. Because if you say to people, this space is safe, then you're potentially excluding a lot of people from that conversation. I hope that makes sense in the way that I'm saying it, that I think providing more inclusive language around that would be very helpful for venues, for DIY spaces, for nightclubs, for folks that are organizing those spaces. Um, and then I also thinking about safety for not only women, but also trans and non-binary communities. I think that there's not enough support of those communities, and I think that we need to be also discussing that more. Thank you. I think that's, um, I almost fell down just now. I was so afraid of that earlier. Um, I think that that speaks specifically to the idea of policy. When you talk about thinking about creating spaces that are safe and what that means and how we use that kind of language. Um, and policy is such an interesting thing and I would love to spend this time kind of fantasizing about policy. Um, because I think policy is interesting, uh, because fantasy is the food for policy. We, we fantasize about what we want, and then we figure out how to create language and rules around that together. So I'd love if we all could talk a little bit about safety. Anthony, do you want to, want to talk a little bit about that? Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that was a, an excellent point. And as a club owner and a member of the LGBTQ AI plus community, um, my eyes have been open to what a safer and more inclusive environment means. I have a friend in the audience tonight um, who has an organization called RAMP. Her name is Tina Peterson here. And she has helped me immensely understand the part of safety when it comes to physical safety and physical inclusiveness by being aware of the accessibility challenges that are out there. Without meeting the people I have in my community, people like yourselves, and these types of discussions, the policies that can be created for us, they have to be created by us. We ourselves have to know that the policies are needed and created by us, then we will stand behind them. So this is really a major important area. Also, as a business, it does include and help you grow more. And if we can make people understand that, then I think it's more likely that they'll understand creating these policies themselves, where they know that truly they, uh, something that has to be part of your business plan, not an add-on, it has to be part of the whole idea of your venue, and we will all benefit from this. Travis, Travis, you want to talk about safety at all? Um, uh, first, I want to say good evening, everyone, and uh, really pleasure to, to be asked to be on this panel. If you had found me in college partying at the Coliseum, that I would be on the panel talking about improving nightlife with the owner of Coliseum, I would tell you, well, that's exactly where I would want to be. So I worked out, college worked out. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so for Millennial Rhode Island, um, which is my sort of volunteer project, uh, I work in policy around housing um, and after school and summer learning primarily. Um, we're trying to sort of reverse the brain drain and recruit more young people uh, to stay in, the, stay in the state. So this has been going on since uh, 2015. And one of the top issues that we always get is obviously jobs. You need you need an income to stay in a place. Uh, housing, affordable housing, nice, safe, clean, affordable housing, and a culture. Um, and culture being obviously nightlife, a big part of that. Uh, and we, uh, myself and Councilwoman Kat Curran, who couldn't be here today, 
uh, we're looking to launch um, a PVD After Dark, which is a campaign to talk about the positives that go on in, in nightlife and very inspired by um, Chairman Dylan Conley's work and, and in the Board of Licensing to actually introduce a, a big idea and how we can sort of rethink nightlife. And basically, the ask that we have is to follow that, those policy proposals that you already have. So maybe just copy and paste and just sort of, you know, put into sort of Providence law. But the concept of having sort of a, a office of nightlife or a night czar, um, I, I think in Providence, if it's called sort of a night mayor, be like, oh, so you're replacing the mayor <laughs> right, right now. So um, uh, figure out the title, but I think that's so important because we have been reactive to nightlife and Providence historically. Born and raised in the city, and that's what happens. There's a stabbing, there's a shooting, the place closes down and sort of a recycle. That's basically what we've been doing um, in, in Providence. So to have this investment, you know, you have New York City that just created an office of nightlife. I'm pretty sure there's a lot, learn, a lot that we can learn from New York City. Other places are in the country, in the world that have been creating this. So there's already a public policy foundation for Providence, and Providence is the creative capital. What are we doing to enhance creators to make sure they are flourishing here? And if we're talking about music, and especially if uh, individual music um, makes it big, I, I, you know, I think of uh, rapper Flawless, who uh, was a finalist on a on a Netflix show. You know, he's talking about Providence. That is tourism. That is that's free promotion for our city. And one of the things I constantly see is entertainers, musicians talking about the lack of venues or the lack of spaces to actually show their show their talent, show their art. So we have to make music. We have to make nightlife a part of our economy. I mean, we're, again, we are the creative capital. If we're not doing that, then what are we doing sort of in, in Providence? Um, so that's how I think about it in, in, in terms of safety, in terms of we just need to be proactive. And I think we have a great opportunity to do that with this discussion right here, which I haven't seen a discussion like this, at least during my young professional time, and with all the energy that's going on. So thank you. Certainly not in my lifetime have we had a conversation. I never thought that would happen, that we would be talking about bars and nightlife and music in such a scholarly feeling uh, way. It's kind of amazing. Um, so, uh, Tom, I'd love for you to jump in about uh, some of your, the way you curate the Columbus in a way and the way you deliberately think about the shows that you're having and the slow growth that you've chosen or maybe happened by accident around the Columbus. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I was part of the group that helped get the theater reopened back in 2012 and Back then, it was really uh, a volunteer effort and uh, sort of a part-time thing. And, and uh, the relationship that we had with the owner of the theater was, was really uh, kind of uh, flexible and, and generous that let us, you know, it, it, some months we would do two shows, some months we would do 10 shows. And that is kind of unheard of for, uh, you know, to, to have that, uh, that flexibility. So it let us really be careful and, and deliberate in the beginning about what kind of programming we were doing and, and trying to think of things, you know, artists and, and uh, performers that we wanted to bring to Providence and that we thought would be of interest to, to the neighborhood and, and not just be open every night and, and, and try and throw a bunch of stuff in there that was just going to, you know, make a ton of money. Uh, and making money is nice, but we wanted to, you know, we wanted to, to kind of slowly build it and uh, react to, to what the neighborhood wanted. Okay, I think, Spaka, do you want to talk a, thank you, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about your project right now and th your thoughts about growing that and the, what you're thinking about that? Yeah. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Good? Feeling good? Yeah. All right, so being in Rhode Island it, as an artist has been a very interesting journey because, you know, we are still building an infrastructure for artists to be able to climb and sustain a career as an artist. You know, sometimes I hear people say like, oh, I just do it for fun. Like, you know, if you have a talent, you should be able to pursue that seriously. And um, 
myself as being an artist, I found that there was a lack of opportunity or opportunities were um, only available to certain people in certain areas or associated or affiliated with certain people um, or other individuals, however you want to say it. So for me, developing and curating came from the need to just like, you know, make it happen myself. I wasn't going to sit and wait for someone else to do it for me. And I figure if I need to take that opportunity and curate my own show or my friend's show, then there must be hundreds or thousands of other artists out there that are in the same predicament. So that, would, that is what made me come up with, uh, you know, like showcases that happen locally, but also opening up public in Onlyville. Um, an important thing about that was being in the community. We didn't, we didn't want to be like downtown. Nothing wrong with downtown. Don't like, you know, come after me. But um, we felt in order for the city to grow and for artists to grow, these um, projects and places and hubs needed to also be like embedded in a community. So that's why we chose that space. And um, we move pretty free freely and we allow artists to um, display and showcase their work in the way that they think best represents them. And, um, and we just took that approach just because, like I'm an illustrator as well, um, and trying to get to other galleries, we always find like, most of the time it's like, all right, what's your resume? Where have you been? What have you done? But it's like, hey, I'm just starting. You know, can I get my foot in the door? And then it doesn't happen. So we didn't want anyone to feel held up and um, have full creative range of what they wanted to do. And um, yeah, it's very important for, as you were mentioning, like artists, you can start and hone your talent here and then you like move to California or you go somewhere else and that's not helping Rhode Island grow. You know, we need to situate things where people can stay here um, and also maybe other artists might want to leave California. Like, oh, Providence is like where it's happening, so let's go over there. Um, and over the years, I've seen great things happen, like PVD Fest, and it's been an honor to be part of that. And that's definitely helped tons of artists. I have, since the day after we ended last year, I've had a phone call like at least once a week. Hey, can you put me on the PVD Fest? <laughs> so it's, it's um, cool to be um, associated with that, but it's also interesting to see like what the future holds because obviously all these situations are going to inspire other artists to curate for PVD Fest or open up art galleries or become musicians or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that is a really important thing. That this, how do we keep artists? How do we keep young people? And and what is the future? What does Providence look like in the year 2030? So our office right now is working on a cultural plan. Um, Gina Rodriguez, my colleague, is the lead on that project. And so we're doing a lot of visioning about the future and visioning about what do we want to see this city look like for um, in 10 years? And we're really looking to our cultural partners to help us decide some of that stuff and, and think about how we can make that happen. They le are leading the charge. But I would like to ask Shane, if it's possible, to talk a little bit Get, maybe give us some examples of other cities that have been facing this kind of brain drain and, and, and artist retention. Maybe there's some policy recommendations around that that you can think of. Um, yeah, sure. Lots of, there are lots of places that are, you know, not, nothing is like Providence, but there are lots of places that are similar to Providence uh, in terms of their issues. One that we're looking at so one that we're working with is, is Tulsa, Oklahoma. I think it's maybe a bit bigger, but um, has anyone been to Tulsa? All right, so I could say anything. That's right. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> Tulsa has really uh, done, their Office of, of Tourism and Economic Development, that's the same office there, um, has done a, a ton of work to essentially weave the music heritage story and cultural heritage story that's there um, into how they market and promote the city. They've also attracted archives to move there. They have the Bob Dylan archive and the Woody Gothier archive. 
Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie do not have a huge amount to do with Tulsa. Just it's it's. But what they did is they chose one particular thing to start with, and they worked on that. So for them, it was about music tourism and heritage and archiving. That's just one example. Um, another example that we work in Huntsville, Alabama. Has anyone been to Huntsville? Okay. Um, <laughs> both Tulsa and Huntsville are great. You know, Providence is greater, but um, it's. Huntsville uh, is where NASA is, so it's, it's actually Huntsville we have a problem most of the time. And um, so they, they, they focused their nightlife and music question simply on quality of life indicators. So they had a lot of people who had nothing to do after 6 p.m. So they really, so, they, so we worked and we, we, we worked with over a thousand local people to really understand what they were missing in terms of the evening nighttime economy offer after six. It wasn't us saying, oh, let's have a nightclub or oh, let's have a festival. It was purely responding to what the local community wants. And we always say it's, it's you know, I'm, I travel around the world and I, I get to speak in a more generalist perspective, right? Because I'm not, I, I don't have a city now even London, where I'm intricately involved, because we work in a number of different cities. And, but the one thing that we've learned is the, most, the best cities work with what they have and listen to the people who live there. Because the, the solutions may not all be here, they may be elsewhere, but the implementations here and the abiding of those solutions and the respect and driving. And, but I think that there are tons and tons, you know, those are just two examples. There's, there are lots of cities in the UK and Europe that have um, had significant manufacturing job losses that have taken old buildings and turned them into co-working and creative spaces. So lots of examples of that. Um, I could go on. Yeah, but I would love to hear what the, how, what the panelists would like to see in that after six fantasy. So we're asking, what, how do you want that after six fantasy? Fantasy. Tell me, tell me a story, Travis. Tell me how you want the nightlife to look after six. Like, what's your, what's your way it, walking downtown or in Olneyville? Ideally, I want a lot of live music. I, live I wanted music. to, yeah. I, I'd like to go to different spaces and hear from different artists and different genres. Um, yeah, we, we just don't have that. Uh, and 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 to to go into like the the brain drain just a little bit, you know. Mo I, been working for the past five years to raise awareness like hey we need to keep young people quote unquote millennials um in the state you know i'm 29 i'm washed right now so uh, gen z <laughs> gen z the next generation i bring that up because gen z is the generation coming up that cities and towns like if you're trying to get top talent that'd be a generation you're trying to focus on and one of the studies that they had in terms of when they were thinking about potentially buying a house or living in a community nightlife is a top five indicator that 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 they're looking for but for for providence i i i would love just a lot of um yeah a lot of live music uh i i, I think there is a space to have spaces that are have places that are open past two or at least policies where there are soft closings where you don't have a ton of people out in the street at the same time um there's a lot of public safety reasons uh, to go and do that but it, it's so important you know i love the work that's going on at act because it's so important that we start this investment now especially when we're talking about retaining talent uh with the next census coming hopefully everyone takes the census uh, we've historically sort of had a stagnant population uh in the state and that could cost us a federal delegation um which we have over three billion dollars in our ten billion dollar budget dedicated to federal dollars so when we're talking about places to make um, a community great that inspires people to stay in, uh, nightlife has to be part of that. But yeah, definitely, again, nightlife uh, for music, I would love to see that. I don't know about other panelists in terms of what after six would mean for them. So I guess after six means for me uh, really a tiered system of entertainment. Uh, so Providence is a capital city. We talk about things like world-class and destination cities. You have to create the destinations. It can't just be one destination for one group and one particular type, and you have to execute it at a world-class level. We have to have a tiered system. You have to be coming here early after six for certain types of entertainment that are inclusive 
and expanded to bring people in, which will then layer themselves into people staying in our city, eating in our city, going out, having a lot of choices so that people don't say they don't want to come there because nothing is there for them. So we layer this and we create this nighttime economy that starts right at dark and ends at dark almost before we're getting to light again. And I think if we can have this overall picture where we all share in this growth over time by having layers of entertainment that come throughout the night, I think we can have a much more successful and a destination and a world-class type of environment. Me too, yes, yay. Roz, you wanna talk about After Six? Sure, um, I got so many dreams about After Six. Yeah, I love um, dreams, dreams, dreams. <laughs> um, so a, a, an idea that I've had for many years that I would love to see come to fruition at some point if the money was ever to allow for it is actually uh, more spaces that are all age spaces that perhaps, um, I'm, I'm just super youth oriented y'all. I teach kids and you know, I. I work at Girls Rock, I'm on the board there, I volunteer there every summer, so so much of what I do is seeing young people come up in the community and me being a young person that came up in the city, I'm born and raised in Providence, went to the public schools here, uh, it was difficult to book shows. It was hard to find places to play. I actually want to give a big shout out to Lizzie, who booked my band at Firehouse 13. I don't even know how many times you booked us, but holy moly, so many times. There's a time that I think we played there like six times in three months. Oops. Uh, and so, but you provided that opportunity and we grew those shows there. Those shows got wild there, but it was, it was a similar thing as to what you talked about, Spock, as not having access to a lot of things, being pushed out of a lot of things, being a young person in the city that nobody wanted to work with, no venues wanted to host because we weren't going to buy drinks. So it's hard to find places to play. So I think in, in my dream, uh, there would be more all-age spaces available that maybe aren't going all night, but perhaps they're the place that some nights are starting. You know, some people say, you know, pre-game potentially, but you know, events that happen between the hours of six and 10. So people with children can go to sleep, for example. So it's not just for all night partying, which I'm all about y'all, I'm not saying I'm not, um, but to have opportunities of different types of programming for people. And I also am a huge advocate for more sober spaces. Um, I was actually having a conversation with my mom recently about how I haven't drank in about a year. Um, and she said, wait, so should I not drink tonight? And I said, no, drink, get your drink on. This is, not, this, is not a, this is not a saying that I am against alcohol in spaces. It's more about offering another option for people to go to spaces and not feel that culture of pressure to drink. And then, a, you know, especially offering program again for young people where there's not pressure to drink or underage drink, you know, in our society, for example. Um, so anyways, I'm... I'm very much focused on all ages programming as the future, as perhaps the earlier part of this uh, night um, time economy. Um, yeah, so after six, <laughs> um, no, I would like to see more um, interactive things happening. Um, and that's kind of like if you go to Boston, I don't remember what the space is, but they have like a spot where they do, like they have like swings outside or, you know, interactive things, not that you necessarily have to pay to do it, but you can still go out there and hang out with people. So I think, you know, you could walk down Thierry Street, there's nothing to do. You could walk through downtown, there's really nothing to do. So how can we like activate these spaces and make it more like more inviting that people would want to actually like hang out there, you know? Um, I think it's great that we're having a lot of murals go up around the city and um, other different pieces of art. So that's cool. Like I specifically go to spots just to see those pieces. But um, I think it would be great if we had something that can like people can be engaged with, you know, and not have to only go to a concert or a market or anything like that, but it's like, what else can we provide? Yep. Tom, oh, sure. uh, Tom, you want to talk a little bit about After Six? Why not? 
Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you don't have to. You do not have to talk about that. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking, what is it about the... Micah, how are we on time? Okay. Um, so, and I think I'll put this to the audience too. Do you think the city is open to all kinds of programming in the nightclubs all over the city? Um, do you think that there is a bias around programming? Uh, I just want to just say that sentence and see what, what comes up. Tom? Sure, yeah. I, you know, I, th I think about that a lot of the time, booking shows and, uh, you know, I, I only know what I know, you know, and, and, and now at this point too, so much of the programming that we do is artists or booking agents that are reaching out to us and trying to juggle that balance of, you know, doing X number of shows per month and which shows are going to uh, draw a crowd and, and uh, you know, which, which shows are of interest. Um, and so what I've, what I've been like realizing lately is uh, that I, I like have, I've been enjoying talking with my staff and, uh, and learning about what they're listening to. And, and a lot of times that is, it is the younger generation. I, I realize now I'm like starting to be way out of touch. And, uh, Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, yeah it, it's, uh, it hurt, you know, uh, but, but it's true. So uh, I'm, I've been excited to think about ways of starting to incorporate other people into the, the booking and, and, and uh, getting other points of view on stage. Anthony? Anthony? So I think the truth of the matter is that there is a negative perception for some genres of music, hip hop and rap. There have been some uh, safety issues that seem to be associated with them, with perhaps the place that is playing that music. Unfortunately, this perception has become the reality to everyone who does not actually know or understand the industry itself. And we have to somehow make everyone understand that we shouldn't be excluding any particular type of music because there have been some issues that have been associated at a place that's playing this music. This is something, it's sensitive, it's difficult to talk about. Um, there are issues within this where um, there's some levels of racism within this. And it's, it's hard to say, look, I, I'm an I'm a old, white, privileged guy, okay? And you have to understand this. And I say that because I see through my eyes, but I have to see through everyone's eyes. And I have friends in the community, and I have friends in this industry that help me see the reality through their eyes. So we unfortunately do have a bad perception with this. I'm not saying I have the answer. I can tell you that 99% of the people who go and listen to a particular type of music do not want an unsafe atmosphere. They want to listen to a music they love, they've grown up on, they can enjoy in a safe and well-run environment. Unfortunately, a few boneheads ruin it for everyone. But we as a city have to come together and figure a way to make sure we can include all types of music and not exclude them because of a few unfortunate incidents. So the last thing I'd like to say too is, it's so hard with live music. I tried on the first floor of my club for years. It's so hard to, to, to give an opportunity to live music because we can't seem to draw enough people in to support as a venue owner, to support the ability to do this. The smaller, 
bands are struggling. The smaller artists are struggling. Usually when we have a big venue with headliners, we can add in our smaller uh, uh, local people. So we just got to figure out these ways. We have some great things going on. This space here is a place that I think you can showcase a lot of that. Beautiful, inviting, well done, and in a beautiful area where we need to be activating some people coming and knowing that this exists. Absolutely. Let's hear it for Bohm's Theater. Thank you for having us. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to open up for questions from the audience. Um, is there anybody who'd like to come on up and ask a question and talk to the panel about nighttime economy? Great. I'll come over to you. I think that what we've seen in Providence, I think, hi, I'm Vita, I'm from the Columbus Theater. Um, I think what we've seen in Providence historically is that, like I, like, I didn't know that there was such a gay Providence in the 1920s. I'm assuming that there was spaces that were cheap enough to rent or to occupy so that that culture that was outside of the mainstream was allowed to flourish. And then it, in the... In your history, it went to Fort Thunder and the DIY spaces, which there were other DIY spaces that have left, like Spark City, that were super important to Providence. But after and uh, Capitol Records, which was a unlicensed um, DIY space that was hosting smaller bands and queer kids and women and bands. I mean, bands that aren't being booked in larger venues. So there's an issue with as. I mean, our economy isn't great in Rhode Island. I don't know if the unemployment rate in the state is still at 10% for the whole state, but it's tough. But uh, people from other places are buying our buildings, and then developers are buying our buildings. And so we can't have DIY spaces because the buildings are no longer available. They're being made into condos and, and warehouse spaces. When we talk about doing things downtown, it also is an issue of, of the economics of space, which is when I walk around downtown, I can either buy something or I can eat something. I can go to AS220, that is true. I can go to a play at Trinity. But it, we need, like, can, are there spaces downtown that me or Roz or Hannah can buy or rent? to open a space independently that doesn't involve selling something to stay in business, right? Like that's, that is the honest conversation we need to be having about Providence. Like, do we, are we, are we, we're, our land is being purchased, our land, which is not our land because it's indigenous land, but our land, the properties in Providence are being purchased by outsiders and real estate developers for projects to make more things to sell us things that don't keep people here or, and, and don't really entertain or, or foster conversations. The other issue is public transportation. Public transportation during the day, at night, in the middle of the night, in the morning sucks. So, it, you know, we want to keep our kids here. We need to be able to have them be able to get safely downtown and back again. We also have to improve relationships with the police in Providence if we're really going to develop a night life in Providence that's safe for everybody, people of color, queer kids, trans kids, our teens in Providence. Um, public transportation. I, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, well, I, I was, I think that's... I think that's it. I think I, that's what we need to be talking about, I think. We should, and we should have another conversation and have honest conversations about what we need to do. But if we want to keep the kids here, buying homes here and investing here and making music here, then we need to actually be creating spaces for them to play music, to feel safe, to be able to travel, to get downtown, to ride on scooters, to rent bikes, you know, all, all of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Totally agreed. Uh, when I was booking at AS220, I didn't have any bills to pay at that time with the, that space. So I could take risk in booking because the booking wasn't dependent to pay the rent for the space. That makes a big difference in our ability to be creative when we're booking bands and creating space. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tina that Anthony talked about earlier. The one thing I think a big thing for us in Rhode Island is 35% of our community in Rhode Island is disabled. That uses the wheelchair, a walker, prosthetics, or anything. We can't go and enjoy the nightlife because we can't get in. Your next artist, whether it's painting, theater, singer, songwriter, is sitting at home by themselves because they can't get in. 
All we want is the option to be able to go out and enjoy and be with everybody else. If anybody wants to have their building or thing assessed, I do it for free. It's not as inexpensive as you think. It, ask Anthony. Um, I just did his place for him and I'm working on another one with him. It's not as expensive as you think. Will you be 100% ADA compliant? Probably not. But will you be a lot more accessible and let people in? Federal Hill, there is one restaurant I could actually go in and eat, but I'm not allowed to pee because I can't get into the bathroom. One on an entire street. We just want to get in. So when you're thinking about all of these artists and venues and projects, Bring somebody like me in. Have us roll around. Have us help you make that space open and accessible for everybody. 35%, who here who owns a business would not want 35% more business? It's only going to help your bottom line in the long run. We are not just disabled nine to five to go to the doctors. We want to get out at night. We want to be out after six. We want to be in the layered portion that you guys are all talking about, but we can't get in. Let us in. Thank you, um, Lizzie. So I have a, a few points. So Anthony's point to you know racism, why there's this misunderstanding of like the type of music that's being played. I also want to add that um, I was in East Providence right over at the outdoor venue and the Roots were playing and there were journalists there. There were all types of people from various backgrounds and various races, young and old, but they were out there. I think part of the problem is that there are certain venues, particularly in the downtown area, who only want to serve a certain clientele. And that is a bit problematic. But we also need to think about, um, when we're thinking about the arts and music and culture industry, we're always focused on downtown. I live, I'm from Providence, I grew up, I, like I said, I'm, I'm from the south side. Um, but I lived in Philadelphia, and in Philly, there is this robust industry where you can go somewhere, like further down Broad Street and it's near South Street, they would hold this weekly jam session and high school kids would play. I mean, if you think about the roots, the Philadelphia experience, how you know, Questlove and his band and how they came about, they were playing while they were in high school in various venues. So I think part of the problem, part, some of the issue is not just focusing on downtown, but creating corridors of arts, culture, um, and music. Um, so I will say, like, I proposed over the summer, I had proposed this idea. There was this big idea challenge with New Deal leaders, and it's a national organization. So I proposed an idea around a transit corridor. And I just found out, like, Friday that I'm a finalist, finalist out of 50 people who, um, um, one of five finalists out of 50 people who submitted their um, policy ideas. And... And part of it was focused on, like, last year, a conversation with some other people that Travis, Lizzie, myself had. And I will say Travis has been advocating for the music and nightlife industry since, like, I've met him. And that was one of the things that he, like, continuously advocated for. And there were other people. And part of it was I wanted to create an environment here in Providence that I had in Philadelphia or that I see when I travel throughout the world, whether it's in Europe or Central or South America. And transportation plays a vital role. And having this corridor where you have North Main Street um, and Broad Street has the R line. It is the most active transit line in the state of Rhode Island. But yet, North Main Street is underdeveloped, underutilized. What if we had opportunities where people can create businesses? We had inclusionary zoning where there could be homes, um, there could be art studios, um, there could be venues, and people can bike and walk up and down the street. They had access to public transportation so they wouldn't have to rely on a personal car or Uber 24 seven. So just creating communities, because within communities you want arts and culture. And when we think about arts and culture or music, we think that they need to be in isolated areas and people don't understand that is what makes a community. I lived in Philly, Mount Airy. I could walk up a block and go listen to live music. I can go to an art studio down the street. I took my son to see, um, we used to have the Wessel Clean Jazz Festival, and I took him to see Parliament and Funkadelics at five years old. So, but that's, that is the community that I want to see. And also, 
to your point about like, you know, it's like millennials who go out. So I call the club, a troop is like my club because you know, they have this Afro beats kind of um, dance party once a month. I went to a stay silent event, um, which the music is amazing. People from all sectors in all ages want to go out. They want to listen to live music. They want to dance. I have friends who are lawyers, doctors, professionals, young and old. When it's time for us to not think about politics or you know, what we do during the day, we want to get out. And I think it's important to take that into consideration that it's not just for millennials, it's for everyone. And it's also incorporating the talent that we have here in Providence. So I do think that we need to also think about, like, as you create the, the plan, but to think about how do we, and I think I've emailed about this, how do we tell the story of Providence? What is the overarching arts, industry, and culture plan? And how does every single neighborhood, every single community play in role, a role in that overarching plan? And I think that is some of the things that we, you know, we need to really think about in incorporating um, transportation, mobility, ensuring, in Philly, I would go in my 20s dancing, and there was this guy who was paralyzed, and he would be, he was so cute too, he would be on the dance floor dancing with everyone. I mean, but that club was accessible, like he can go in, he can use the restroom. And so we need to create spaces where it's inclusive to all people and we need to also again think about how we create these communities with the overarching plan. Sorry. No, no, that's great. Thank you, Council. <laughs> okay. Micah makes a good point. Would anybody like to reply to any of these things that people are saying? Yes, I'll be, I will be right there. I just wanted to ask, Mike asked me to ask the people to reply, so I'm following Micah's instruction, and now I'm walking over here. So I do want to say, okay, I do want to say that I don't, I, oh, I'll tell you later. Give it up for Lizzie. <laughs> before, I wanna, before I ask my question, I want to say that I think one of the single most important economies we have in Providence is our nightlife and our restaurants, so we have to prioritize fixing these issues so that this economy can grow and thrive in our capital city. Um, the question that I have is, how do we balance the, uh, the need for a vibrant nightlife with also the need for public safety? When I say public safety, I'm talking about uh, during winter time, we have snowstorms. Um, so how do you, how do you balance um, you know, the need for public safety issues when it comes to snowstorms and nightlife? You guys don't have a mic? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. sorry, thanks. Hi. Hello. So, um, because I own a venue, I used to get very angry with the city of Providence when they would put on a parking ban when we were having two inches of snow until I decided to talk with the administration and understand why we were doing this. So it was important that we understood why, for public safety issues, we had to put a parking ban on, we had to ensure that it was going to be safe for people to come into our city. That being said, I no longer feel the way I used to feel. So to answer your question directly, Joe, um, when a snowstorm is coming, unfortunately if it's on a Saturday night, which is a large night for almost every venue in the city of Providence, okay, I realize now that it's just part of doing business. I need to build this into my business plan and I basically go the route of public safety for my employees and for my patrons, and I simply close for the night. There will be another night. There will be more days without snow than there are with snow. But this was a learning process. It's a hard one. When a lot of venues here are just making it, and that Saturday night sometimes is all the money for them to get to next week, very hard for them to feel the way I'm feeling right now. But I can say to you, I went through my downtimes too like everyone has, Coliseum has been 10 years, one of the largest venues in the state. They don't last 10 years. So what I used to do was I had to put my own money and my partners had to put our own money in to get through. But the right way to do it is to have a long-term plan. Public safety has to be paramount and first if we want to have a vibrant, inclusive, and prosperous nighttime economy. Get it through all our heads now. That is first and foremost, and then we will succeed, in my opinion. Absolutely, we have to daylight the nighttime, right? 
everybody. And transportation is significant for people who work in the, in the nighttime economy, when the buses stop running at midnight and you have to get home at 2 a.m. Uh, quick question. Uh, how do we convince voters, not just anyone, but voters, that nightlife is in their best interest? It's a good question. Um, before I answer that, of all the cities that we've worked, uh, like 55 odd, uh, public transport's been an issue in every single one. So clearly that's something that needs to be worked on everywhere. Uh, it's very, very, very difficult to, um, uh, I've learned, to convince voters that nightlife matters. And often those who most experience the nightlife are those who aren't voting as much as they should be. So I think it's a, there's, there's two issues. One is getting more people to vote, uh, especially those who are younger um, and experiencing that time economy. And second is I, it, it's, it's explaining it the way that we're explaining it today over a longer period of time. It's developing a new public conversation that outlines the benefits and values that nightlife has while not shirking public safety challenges that nightlife has. You're right, if there's a snowstorm, you close. It, you know, it, that sucks, but you close. Um, and, but we have, we have seen that the ways to do it are just consistent marketing and communication around what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it and being very open and honest about that. And to linking it um, to tourism and branding and saying this is something that you know, makes the city, um, you know, I'd say more marketable in one way or another and saying this is going to make the city better, that tends to, that tends to work to get people to, over time, you know, if we put our money and our time and our policy where our mouth is and people see the changes, then they tend to start to, over time, understand the value of nightlife more. But it's not going to happen overnight. It could take two elections to make that happen. We have, trust me, we have a, a lot of people who still are not happy that we created a night czar in London. There's a lot of people who aren't happy about the Office of Nightlife in New York and Ariel and, and that role. Um, but there's far more people who are happier now than are unhappy. I'm learning that. And slowly the pendulum is swinging, very, very slowly. You know, there's, so it, it's, it's, it is that, it's a sustained, structured, researched, educated, and defendable communication strategy that is backed up by doing stuff. <laughs> so the, the city says that we are going to do something, you do it, uh, warts and all, and, and learn from our mistakes and continue to improve. This thing, a music strategy and a nightlife strategy is a process. There's no end here. Once you do it, you're doing it. Again, like a garbage removal strategy, you're never gonna stop picking up the garbage, you're gonna stop paving the roads. If you start to invest in nightlife as a policy, you're investing in nightlife as a policy. That is something that Providence is going to be doing forever. So it's one of those things that you just have to develop over time. Hope that helped. Absolutely. I think that we are going to end this conversation now for the night. Um, people, we were only supposed to go to 7.30 and I think people are uh, leaving. Does somebody over here want to want to ask a question or say anything? Have I forgotten anybody? Okay, here we go. We'll do one more and then we'll, we'll be, be done. Hi everybody, my name is Nate Lemoy. Um, through my organization, New England Rhythm Games, I run arcade gaming tournaments at Free Play Bar and Arcade. Uh, I wanna, at the risk of sounding like a suck up, thank Anthony and the rest of the Free Play leadership team for being an excellent group of people to work with. And definitely check them out if you haven't been there. My birthday party's here tomorrow, Friday. You should all come down, you're all invited. Outside of running arcade tournaments, I, um, I do light shows. I'm a performing light show artist. This rig, I have one just like it. I bring it to different venues. Um, and I have a sold out show on Saturday in Boston. I would love for that to be in Providence. Almost all my shows are in Boston, some in New Hampshire and Maine, but I would love to take all of that and bring it to Boston. But I have all these issues such as you're talking about stereotypes attached to genres of music. Most of my shows are with electronic dance music, dubstep, drum and bass, et cetera, which is associated with drug use, which is not my community, but it's painted that way. 
issues like noise and also fog for a light show and things like that. And it's very tough to find venues that are that as close to that perfect mix as you could want for booking something like this. So I guess my question to the panel would be, what have you found is successful for uh, artists still climbing up the ladder, trying to get in with the venue and make something great happen? I think for artists that are looking to climb the ladder, it's just about the relationships that you're building with these venues and then how you treat the space while you're there. Um, so I feel like, you know, that goes on an individual, but it also goes on like artists as myself or as Roz to um, also like educate these younger artists coming up about like the etiquette of working with other business owners, you know, and I think that's a very big part of the growth of the city because those are the next people up. And if, you know, they don't know how to handle things or run things properly, then how are we going to move forward? So I think it's just educating yourself, ask questions, and, you know, build a genuine relationship with venue owners, other promoters or curators and stuff like that. I agree. Yeah. I just want to say I agree with that so much. I feel like that is, I think that a lot of the interpersonal things that happen just on a day-to-day -day basis, like for example, just walking into a venue and introducing yourself and, and saying, I want to play here, this is who I am. I think that those kinds of gestures are, are um, underutilized. I feel like those types of really important connections can really grow the community as a whole. I agree with everything you said, Spaka. Yeah, I think that just walking into a space or calling a space or emailing space and introducing who you are to try to help change the perception. I know that that might sound frustrating, but I feel like this is what we all need to do is be able to um, speak to who we are and we can't necessarily say that we represent an entire community so it's you know it sucks that people see what you're doing in this really general way that does not involve you that's horrible and i and i think that a lot of people in this room can say that they felt some kind of bias in some sort of way like that and so i think the first step is potentially going into a space and introducing yourself and really knocking down that wall to allow the conversation to happen i think if i can just add please I just wanted to add to that also on that point. So, so when we invest in our nighttime economy stakeholders and they are more prosperous, Lizzie brought this up, you can take a chance on something that you didn't think had a bottom line to it and you can give an opportunity to someone who you may not think is gonna bring you in the dollars that needed to come in, but there's a value in that. You're exposing yourself to something new that you don't understand and you're exposing others to something new that they haven't seen. So there is a long-term dollar within that. The last thing I'd like to say, um, is we all have to keep an eye to what we call, and you mentioned it, Travis, the good neighbor policy. This us against them mentality, it's us against the rest of the world. Nighttime economy, nightclubs against the police, against the city, against the schools, against the administration, against the neighbors. One of the best things you can do is reach out to your neighbors, Go in, do what you said, introduce yourself to them. Let them know who you are. They can come and talk directly to you when they have an issue. And we don't have to involve anyone else in this unless it's unresolved. So I think that good neighbor policy should also be right up there with public safety. Absolutely. I also think you should go to shows. Go to shows. That can also help you build relationships. Um, okay, so we're going to end this for this moment. Well, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add on that. It's a good point of going to shows, meeting other musicians or uh, artists and, and, you know, building your community that way. And, and I'd also say, like, uh, it, there's, you know, a lot in this... Uh, business is is personal and is about relationships but also like it's it's essential not to take it personal if it's like oh okay i asked and I, you know they don't want to book my band or or whatever like you have to a lot of it is you know i mean there's there's bands that i love in this city that still haven't played at the theater after 7 years just it just hasn't happened for whatever reason it's not 
and and so it's uh, you know it's don't take it personal and, and like be persistent and and keep keep asking. <laughs> yeah, I think persistence is a huge part of it. Yeah, finally you're like, all right, shut up, you got a show. Um, yeah. So is everybody good? Any last words from the panel? I want to thank you so much, the learned panel, esteemed. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm going to hand the the. I just want to make one point about community, about how nightlife is about community. It exists and it's there to uphold and elevate community. That's all. Here's my esteemed and lovely boss, Stephanie Fortunato. Thanks, Lizzie. Well, that was great. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, panel. This is an awesome night. I want to um, just say thank you very much to the Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. We do care very much about all these issues. I think it's been amazing to see what has been surfaced tonight, all the systems, really, that the music economy does touch. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce you and say thanks um, to, to all of the staff. In the corner, we have our Gen Z staff teaching us every day. We've got Afrisha Ben, Elvira, Elzoko, and Alana Hauskinet, wherever she is. Um, we have up front Gina Rodriguez, our cultural affairs manager, also a dancer. Uh, Lael Tucker is here somewhere. She's our Turnaround Arts Providence local program director. Um, and over here we have Micah Salkind, our special projects manager, also DJ, singer, cultural historian who's written about um, Chicago's house music and the DJs and dancers who have helped establish the cultural identity there. Um, Micah, do you have any thoughts for us to close out the program? So thank you all so much for bearing with my many emails and for you know, doing everything that, that made this all come together. And we have been recording this conversation, so we can all refer back to it and do our advocacy and activism work around this important topic. I think for me, um, you know, I studied Chicago's house music history for seven years, and I wrote this book about it. And one of the big things that kept coming up was this youth question, like what are we doing to train people so that when you're at a, an age where you can be in a, you know, a nightclub or a venue that's 21 plus where there are, you know, where drinking is happening and that's a big part of the economy, you already know how to behave. You already know how to comport yourself. So one of the things Chicago did was there were 501c3 nonprofit juice bars where kids could go party and learn how to be in culture together. And then when they came to the clubs later, they already knew how to do it. So that's just to say, I think part of this, and I think Shane, you really spoke to this well, is what's the story we want to tell? Is it a story about all our deficits and what we don't do right? That's part of the equation, but I think it's also like, let's lead with our assets. Let's figure out what we have here, our unique alchemy, the history of the gay, the gay nightlife here, the history of the underground scene, the amazing live music that's you know percolating in our neighborhoods on Broad Street, in Olneyville, on North Main. So, Let's like take that story seriously and, and start narrating it in a new way. So that's that's what I'll leave you all with. And Stephanie has one more thing. I made an egregious error, and I just want to say, uh, Michael Cristofaro in the back of the room hiding. He actually faded into the the wall when I looked over there. Anyway, Michael goes to see more shows and concerts than anyone probably in this room. So I want to thank him for all that he does for the staff as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just leave you with uh, a few announcements from our department. PVD Fest participation. Please, please get in there on, on our website and sign up to participate in whatever way you perform or do your thing. Um, we are going to be running cultural advocacy workshops. So if you don't know how to reach out to your elected officials, we're working with Rhode Island State Council on the Arts and the Council on the Humanities and United Way, which is awesome, to offer cultural, uh, cultural advocacy trainings in the spring. So you can get in touch with, the, uh, with our team if you want to know about that. And then um, the cultural planning process that Gina is going to be running over the next uh, year, probably, however many months it takes, um, please do participate. We need, you, we need your voices. We need you to help us get the word out to other people. Um, and also, last but not least, this is my stump speech of join a board. If you want to participate in our culture, be serve, you know, serve your community in, in a way, or, you know, be even on a, an, if it's not a nonprofit, be a part of an organization like the Columbus, or, you know, I'm sure you're looking for good board members, Travis, all the time, like, th this is how you participate, there's so many different ways, so thanks everybody, and uh, enjoy your evening. <laughs>